you really have to be mind, body, spirit aligned. You really have to also focus. Your horse can pick up on your energy and emotions. And if you're not in the right state that day, if your mind is buzzing with so many things, then the horse will sense that. We all need to be present. And with horses, they are the greatest teachers of being present. Hi, everyone. It's Joe. You're listening to Occupational Hazards, a series of candid conversations with some of the most inspiring people I know as they share their path to finding their calling and all the gritty realities of their jobs. Whether you want to demystify your dream job or are someone like me who enjoys getting a peek into other people's work lives, then this is the podcast for you. Our next guest grew up in the saddle. She can talk at length about the history of horses, as well as their healing power, and what they can teach us about ourselves. Dani Virata is an equestrian and riding instructor from a family of horse enthusiasts who have competed internationally in various events. She and her siblings run DXD Equestrian Specialists, Inc., which offers group and private riding lessons, catering to aspiring competitors, adult leisure riders, and beginners. They also have classes for children. Headquartered at Rancho Leonor in Silancavite, just outside Metro Manila, DXD's home base is a great place to relax, enjoy nature, and appreciate the simple joys of life around animals. Danny herself has competed in several show jumping competitions and earned certifications from the British Horse Society and FEI, or the International Federation for Equestrian Sports. She previously taught in Singapore at a local riding school, as well as under the Equine Assisted Learning Program, or EQUAL, that was co-developed by the Singaporean Equestrian Federation to cater to at-risk youth. Her teaching standards have been approved by the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship, or PATH International, and the Equine Assisted Growth and Learning Association, or EGALA. Danny comes alive when talking about all things equine, including how horses have been man's partner since the dawn of civilization. What can we learn from these magnificent creatures? Here's Danny to share all her stories with us. Hi, Danny. Hi, Joe. How are, How are you? you? I'm good. <laughs> thank you for having me on your podcast. Yeah, thank you for agreeing to be here. I'm super excited because I think that a lot of people have been feeling cabin fever and trapped indoors, but your work actually involves being like outdoors all the time. <laughs> so we would love to kind of hear about what your experiences have been like. Can you tell us a bit more about where you are in your pandemic arc before we delve into your work? Well, I'm an equestrian, so I really have to be with the horses all the time. And I'm lucky that I have a farm where our clients have sent the horses. So, you know, because of the pandemic, it's better that actually that they're in pasture, like the horses are enjoying it more now because they usually live in the city in a cooped up stall. They don't get much paddock time. So right now, my family and I have been taking care of the horses and still teaching riding lessons. So we're surprised that like so many people are willing to go out of town because they really want the nature. And we've been teaching riding lessons back to back. It's been busy. And my mom and I have been alternating teaching in the city while my brother teaches in the farm. You've had a really interesting 2020. I know that before the pandemic, you were heavily involved in rescue operations for some tal ponies as well, right? So after the volcano erupted, you and your friends rounded up a group of volunteers and the logistics to get the ponies off the island and to safe harbor. Is that right? Well, it started off just through an online video that I saw. These ponies were still left in the Ta'al Island, caked in ash, super sad, just standing there, like 
barely breathing. And then the locals tried their best to get them. And I posted this video on my Instagram stories. And it was really amazing how quick people started to get together and try to organize like boats to go save them on the island. We had some people that on Instagram and Facebook were trying to organize a farm where they can send the horses, supplies. There were people who were donating money. And then my friend from, actually she was in the States doing all the planning and she organized like for trailers to pick up the horses. They have a GoFundMe page. So it started to just get bigger and bigger. And then the organization was filled with strong women Some were equestrians, like from the polo club. Some were vets and animal lovers, former equestrians. And so we were able to get like these two farms together and they saved about 149 horses. And there were some that were pregnant. So there were foals on the way. There was one foal that was born in the rescue island, like where they brought the horses. Some of them are on your farm right now, right? You use them in your riding school to teach beginner riders how to ride. Is that correct? Yes. My mom actually chose them from PAWS. So there was another organization that also had their own rescue. And my mom let us use the ponies for pony rides for, you know, young kids to be led around. So they're not working hard, but they're working for their food in a way. But Yeah, we're still training them to become more, you know, well-behaved because some of them can get pretty naughty and like they still have to get used to human beings. Like some might be a bit nippy, you know, so we're training them. The grooms have been helping us and it's been just fun to get to know them. Like we have one that actually has potential to be a jumper (laughs) because he didn't like to be left alone in the paddock. And he jump off and twice it happened. And we were like, wow, this is potential to become a real riding school pony. That's so nice. It's like you gave him a career path in a way. I think it's fascinating because I saw pictures. I mean, you, you kind of condensed the story, but I saw the photos and the videos of the rescue that you were sharing right before the pandemic. And it actually sounds like something out of a film. I guess because of all the commotion around the pandemic, it was quickly kind of swept aside as one of those early 2020 events. But I I really like hats off to you guys for all the work that you did there. Um, But speaking of career path, which, you know, these horses now have, can you talk about how you found your way into becoming an equestrian? Well, it really started with my parents who met in the Manila Polo Club when they were teenagers. And my mom had always been passionate and knew what she wanted to do with her life. So my dad, He was doing it as a summer activity and it was just starting to open up. Polo was for Americans only back in the days. And uh, my parents wanted to learn how to ride. So they actually sought lessons from this sergeant who at that time, you know, headed the cavalry in Fort Bonifacio. And my mom and dad, I guess they fell in love then. They got married. I mean, like they went to the Asian games and then they decided to open up a ranch. And yeah, I guess naturally I followed in the footsteps. I was riding when I was eight years old. Like I started jumping at 12. And then when I was 18, my mom started to give me students like on the weekends. So then naturally just, I just wanted to get better, wanted to improve and compete abroad. You know, the dream always is like to go to the Olympics, to be a professional show jumper, but it's a really expensive sport. So, you know, living in the Philippines, it's hard to really maintain that lifestyle. You have to fly back and forth and then you have to always keep your horse fit. So I'm pretty happy, you know, like just in a way, keeping myself fit, learning from different horses, and sharing my love for them with other people, educating the younger guys and making sure that, you know, they're safe when they learn to ride because, yeah, there can be many misconceptions about the sport. And, 
yeah, I just enjoy it. I'm really lucky that I get to do what I do. Like, I think not a lot of people really have that opportunity. So I'm really grateful and blessed that my parents have supported me. And then now we have a whole family business going on. So yeah. When did you actually decide that you wanted to pursue this full time? Because you said you kind of started teaching at 18, but from eight to 18, you were training and kind of learning and doing show jumping. But when did you decide that you wanted to kind of work with horses in whatever capacity full time? Well, after high school, my parents sent me to Atenea, right? Or while I, you know, wanted to take up creative writing. So it wasn't yet you know, riding, I didn't think it was going to be a profession. I didn't think it was so possible. I thought maybe there were already a couple of teachers in polo that I wouldn't be able to get my own students. So I also wanted to work in fashion. So I tried a couple of things after college as well. And the horses just kept calling me back. Like I missed, you know, riding and it just felt right. It just felt like what I had to do with my life was to, you know, just get better, like get my certifications so that at least, you know, I had formal training. Uh, So maybe around like that early twenties, I asked my mom if I could go to the States for a few courses. And then that equine therapy kind of showed up The the courses, you know, were all there in the States and Singapore then offered me a job to teach. So that kind of started the full-time work. And after two years of working in Singapore, I got to return to Manila and take over the students that I had left before I went to Singapore. And then my brother went to France for training. And when he got back, he also wanted to pursue it. So then now that's you know, how we started our team DXD. It stands for Danny, myself, then Javier, my brother, and then Diego, my youngest brother, who actually doesn't really ride now. I mean, he does it leisurely, but he's more focused on doing the food, culinary, you know, he's working in a wine company. So we as a family, like, eventually want to also develop our Rancho Leonor. Uh, our family property in Silang Cavite, and we'll eventually work as a team. But yeah, I think, you know, to answer your question, long story short, is that it wasn't a particular time. It just sort of naturally evolved to where I'm at now. (laughs) Can you talk more about the work you were doing in Singapore? Because that opened up maybe a whole new avenue of working with horses or a way of interacting with the horses. Can you talk a little bit more about what your day-to-day work was like there? And then maybe also your day-to-day work as a riding instructor. And then maybe as an equestrian also, like because there are three different career paths you've done within kind of this equine world. Maybe you can tell us about what does an average day look like as somebody working with, you know, equine therapy and then somebody who's an equestrian and then somebody who's a riding instructor. Right. So as an equestrian, I started competing, right? When I was in high school, I had to go straight to Makati. I was studying in Alabang and my mom, in a way, she saved me from just hanging out with friends and just, you know, at that age, people were starting to smoke. So, you know, I I had this healthy athlete lifestyle. Like I was training, riding horses, like two hours, three hours a day. And on weekends, that's when we'd have horse shows. And in college, I was actually competing in Malaysia for three months. Every two weekends, I'd have to fly out to Manila and take a budget airline. At that time, at least, you know, it wasn't so expensive in a way to do that. And we got some sponsorships. So we were able to, for two years, do two seasons in Kuala Lumpur. And like that, you have to always just be, you know, flexible. Because with horses, there are always some things coming up. Like, there are a lot of problems you have to solve. So you have to be on your feet. You have to always be checking the horses, talking to your grooms. There's a whole team involved. 
it really takes a village. And so you have to be able to manage your time. As an athlete, you have to always check on your horse to make sure that, you know, they eat healthy. You have to balance their exercise. So at that time, my mom was definitely my coach and my manager. So she, you know, really guided me through this path. There were some times that I had to train abroad, like I'd be gone for three weeks. So in Ateneo, at least they let me take a leave of absence. So there was one semester that, you know, I flew to France. And then when I came back after the Southeast Asian Games, then I took a little bit of a break. And then when I resumed being a riding coach, then it was like just lessons in the afternoon. Nowadays, I actually teach also in the mornings. So for example, today I woke up at 7 a.m. so that I could teach my first lesson at 8. And similar as well for Singapore, there were some people that wanted lessons at 7 a.m. And in Singapore, they were more structured because there was actually a bigger demand than what they have here in Manila. And I was waking up uh, at like the crack of dawn and then working until dusk with a five hour break in between. But here in Manila, it's a bit more flexible in terms of like waking up and stuff. And I can manage my own time. Whereas in Singapore, it would be like, you're working from Monday to Saturday. And then yeah, Sundays as well. When, when I was in the Bukatima Saddle Club, Mondays were off days and one half day in a week. So it was really tough. You know, when you're abroad, you don't have the help of the grooms. So sometimes as an instructor, you're asked to clean poop from the arena. That's normal. You're cleaning saddles and tack. You're helping groom and tack up horses. Uh, so it was really like pushing your fitness level. And even in Singapore, sometimes you'd have to uh, help lift jumps, fix courses and stuff because they were low on manpower. So yeah, here in the Philippines, I really appreciate that we have the help because with horses, it's really like a 24 hour job as much as possible. Like you want to uh, make sure, you know, that they have clean water, that they don't get stuck or injured in their stall at night. And so the grooms like in the polo club, you know, they, they live there now and especially during the pandemic. So you have to just help them manage the horses to make sure because they have such sensitive digestive tracts and it's so easy for them to get colic, which is one of the number one killers of horses. So as a rider, you always have to make sure as well that your horse is drinking enough water so they don't get dehydrated. So. Yeah, I mean, your other question in regards to what it was like to do equine therapy. Well, when I first came to Singapore, that was the job and they were starting this equine therapy program. So it was called Equal and it was a nonprofit organization. So the government also provided at-risk youth with the equine assisted therapy. And that job was Monday to Friday, and I had to be at work 7 a.m. And then we conducted three therapy sessions. One had to do with the riding, which is what I thought. Then one was with a PATH certified instructor who was doing, they lunge the horse, and then kids have different challenges and they interact with the horse. Then another one is the horsemanship, which is like grooming, you know, and so these were conducted like the whole day. Uh, we had like a, an hour break and it was really hot in Singapore. So it was really tough for me to, you know, just be always moving around. But from time to time, you know, like as an equestrian and even during the time I was doing equine therapy. We have to ride horses. So that's part of the day as well. Like you train the horses because, you know, if you just leave them for a long time, some of them kind of forget their training. 
So horses need to be like brought out every day, pretty much. That's the healthy thing to do is that their natural instinct is to be walking. They, they, they are nomads in the wild. They move from one place to another in search of grass. So the healthiest option is to provide them pasture and paddocks. And Singapore actually had them, surprisingly enough. They were located near the forest. So I actually got to experience a very green Singapore compared to Manila, because here we do have the polo fields, but in the city, like there are not that many parks, you know, Singapore in a way is much greener. So anyway, going back to the equine therapy, I also experienced having different schools and different groups and having to go to the schools to visit, to learn, to get to know the kids. And that was a new perspective into what horses can do for humans because I grew up, you know, with the pressures of the sport. It's always pushing, like improving yourself. Whereas the therapeutic part was accepting people for the way they are and letting the horses heal them through just being in their presence and seeing how horses are reflections of humans. So they're able to sort of show you what you need to learn. So that part I found very interesting. Yeah. Can you maybe walk us through some of the results you would see? Because in Singapore and under that equal program, you said that you were dealing with at-risk youth, right? Can you maybe talk about uh, some of the exercises you did and then some of the changes that you started to see in these children after the therapy? Yeah. So in Singapore, they were part of a school for kids from rough backgrounds, like they failed their primary level exam. So it was actually a vocational school. So they're teaching them new skills so that they could also grow the equine industry. Um, so some of the kids, you know, they had learning disabilities, either ADHD, they wouldn't concentrate for long. So being around the horses, because they're big animals and they really capture your attention, those kids, you know, with the hyperactivity, they had to like respect the horse and manage their impulsivity and really follow instructions. So towards the end of the program, so for example, one of the schools would send like 20 kids a day. So we'd have 20 kids in the morning, then another batch in the afternoon. And we do this five times a week. And we'd even have to like kind of grade them. Like they were like being graded according to whether they completed the task. And most of them enjoyed and, and, and really like followed instructions really well and progressed. At the end, you know, they were really confident, like just even the, their posture, how they sat on the horse, you know, what they were able to accomplish with the horse gave them that extra boost so that hopefully, you know, it, it lasts longer that just not only physically, like their posture, but behaviorally as well, that they are able to do it. Like in the beginning, maybe they were nervous, crying, they were frozen. Like there are many kids who were just holding on to the saddle, but towards the end of the program, you know, by steering with the horse and like making them listen and work together. We did a couple also like team building. Then the kids learned how to be more empathetic. They were kinder to each other. So it was really interesting to see because, you know, through horses, you can really get more camaraderie between people. I guess it must be so rewarding to see the transformation in the lives of those kids, you know? Do you think you could talk about what is your favorite part of working with horses and all of those different careers you had, you know, within the horse world? And then maybe the least favorite, or it doesn't have to be your least favorite, but it could be something someone from the outside who is considering this as a career path might not see as, you know, super uh, ideal or glamorous. Right. Yeah. My favorite part would be that you're always learning something new. Everyone has a different journey with the horses. People, you know, come from different backgrounds. So 
your experiences are all always going to vary and like in terms of you know mine i still until today still have a lot to learn like even though i've done it my whole life pretty much you'll always encounter that one horse that's a bit stubborn or there are other horses that are very spooky and you have to learn how to balance better and that's the thing with the sport like it really doesn't matter what age like you can do it until you're 70 years old some of the best riders in the olympics are already seniors so it may look also very glamorous but when you're working with horses you need to humble yourself and you need to be willing to do the dirty work and when i say dirty work it's the cleaning you know the attention to the little details like if your horse is a wound you want to be hands on and that's what we actually try to train or to teach our kids is that it's not just about sitting on the horse riding getting off and then you leave the horse already like we want it to be the whole package like you're really caring for another being so you have the responsibility and there's a lot involved it's like i said earlier 24/7 job like if your horse is sick with colic then you better be there to make sure because it can go south really quick my brother for example two nights ago had a sick horse in the farm and he didn't sleep for two days <laughs> and you just have to make sure that this horse you know is going to live because that's how much we care about them and um yeah it's an expensive sport so you want to be wise about the decisions you make and yeah it's just not as easy as it looks some of the best riders make it look like you're sitting and doing nothing but it's a whole full body workout and you are also at the mercy of your horse and if it's a bad day you end up on the ground and hopefully you know not badly bruised but I guess one of the downfalls of our sport why people stay away from it is because you can break bones. I've gotten three concussions. I don't know why I'm still in the sport, but it's like an addiction. So, you know, these things happen. It's normal. It's part of us. When we fall off, you just have to get back on as much as possible. So, if someone's going to be around horses, then you should have quick reflexes because there will be days that you will feel pain and it's not fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean the pop culture icon that comes to mind is I guess Christopher Reeve, no. I mean there are also other athletes who got injured and then didn't quite recover, but he's the one that comes to mind where I guess the injury was so public and I guess that's also why some people are a bit afraid to have their kids ride, right? But then I think if you get the proper training like what you guys are doing, I think that goes a a really long way toward giving people confidence also when they're in the saddle no in terms of cuz you mentioned that you know you have people older who are competing in like competitions abroad what is the average i guess career the span of an equestrian's career or even maybe a racer yes i think there might be an age limit for racing i'm not quite sure but like you said there are you know different disciplines if you will call it and racing is also like a totally different ball game even though they do horses their philosophies are different so i don't know much about the racing world but as a show jumper and in equestrian basically like you can be i think i think there was the oldest rider in the olympics once was a 72 Jap japanese rider like 72 year old who was the oldest for the whole olympics so you can start at any age pretty much as long as of course you're able bodied but some of the professional riders who are in europe are in their 60s and it really depends on the person how well they keep fit but riders actually don't have to be as physically fit as other athletes like they don't have to like push weights every day if they don't want to like you know it depends what their sport is because 
show jumping and cross country are a bit more difficult than dressage in a sense. Sure. I just yeah. asked about the age, but I was wondering, is there anything, because my only, sorry, my frame of reference also is racing because people always make jokes about, I once saw on a t-shirt, there was a joke. It was like, oh, you're so tall. You should be a basketball player. And then the basketball player's response was like, oh, you know, you're, you're like, you're smaller. You should be like a jockey. So there's a stereotype about, you know, horse racers. It helps if they're smaller. But in terms of equestrians, like, is there anything about size or gender or that, might be an advantage or a disadvantage because you said age is not an issue what about the other factors well for racing yes they have to be a certain weight sort of like how boxing is like they i think they want you to be light so that the horse can carry you and they need to go as fast as they can right so there are no heavy jockeys uh in show jumping you can be whatever height or size there's no division you can compete against men who are much older or you know it's the one sport that there aren't that many factors for the rider to be like you can um be really tall and maybe that's an advantage so that you could really wrap your leg around the horse and have better grip or balance but yeah that's not really necessary so it's more on the bond you have with the horse and the training how much experience you've been able to gain together yeah yeah, what makes for a good bond with a horse? Because I was reading one of the, I think it was on your website, where they were talking about the work you and your mom did. Uh, specifically, your mom, sometimes, you know, she would match horses to riders. From what you've seen, what makes a good match or bond between human and horse? Well, your horse, as an athlete, should be able to take care of you from time to time. So there's no perfect rider and there's no perfect horse. but when there's a partnership, if the rider makes a mistake, you'll know that it's a good horse because that horse will be willing to go through or take the rider over the jump. And some horses are more talented than others. And, you know, you have to find the right horse to match the level of the rider. So if it's an inexperienced rider, then we look for an experienced horse that will take care of the rider and be more forgiving. So usually we try to find what they call the bomb proof horses, meaning that they're not so skittish, but there are more experienced riders that are going to be able to ride inexperienced horses and train them. And yet, yeah, they're a good match. They can still progress to the Grand Prix level or there's a lot of potential. Uh, but sometimes we joke and we riders say like, it's finding a boyfriend. You know, you want to be able to <laughs> sort of find the right match after just two or three dates and decide, like, I'm going to commit to you. And it may take a year. It can take longer. It can take less. You don't really know, but it's more a feeling, you know, of confidence that you have with your horse that shows when you go through competition. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, I guess I should have asked this at the start, but better now than never, right? Because you, you touched on the three disciplines under the equestrian umbrella, which is dressage, eventing, and show jumping, right? Can you maybe give us a layman's explanation of each one and then how you chose to focus on jumping? So my parents started in three-day eventing because that was popular in the 70s, I guess. It was th three disciplines. That's why it was three-day event. It's cross-country, which are permanent fixtures. Like the jumps are solid, connected to the ground. You know, that's what actually Christopher Reeves ended up getting into his accident because he was doing like jumping over a log or something. And then like a bunny scared his horse. So that's the most dangerous out of the three. The dressage is more like horses dancing. They look pretty and it's all about keeping the horse in a beautiful frame, you know, like ballet, but for horses. And then show jumping is exciting to me. That's why I chose it. And it's safer than cross country, but it's also jumping over fences, but they can be knocked down. So there is a chance that you still can get into an accident, like, a bad accident, but basically your horse 
won't fall with you. Where in cross country, that is a bigger possibility that his leg gets caught and then you come crashing to the ground. So that's why for me, it's really scary. And I hats off to my parents that they had, you know, the, the balls to do that. <laughs> but yeah, right now in the Philippines, there are not that many dressage riders and there are more show jumpers. So that's why it's easier for us to teach that in our farm. It's, it's something that we all were able to experience in the family. Sure. The career path for an equestrian, you know, some of them become riding instructors. Is there a demand also for people to design these courses? Are the people who design the courses usually like former equestrians also? There is a demand in Asia, I think, to be a course designer, like you have to be certified under the FEI, which is like the world organization. Yeah, I was just curious if people actually went on to design courses. It's something I always wondered about because I don't know if you speak with like a golfer, right? They talk about like, oh, this course is so well designed because so-and-so golfer did it. I was wondering if it was kind of the same in the world of <laughs> equestrian. Well, abroad, the Europeans, they really have people from all different backgrounds, not necessarily riders who become course designers. I think, you know, it depends which country you're looking at, because there are some that have equestrian as a really popular sport. So yeah, I think most are maybe starting from, you know, their love for horses, but I don't think everyone started off as riders. Got it. And then speaking of going all around, right, you've competed overseas, but you've also done some trips. Uh, you specifically spoke about a trip that you did to Mongolia, where you experienced a whole new way of riding, right? Do you think you could tell us more about what you've learned from other countries, including Mongolia? Yeah, well, Mongolia was a really fun trip because I went with my girlfriends right before you know, some of them got married and had kids. So it was really sort of our last hurrah together. And we went to the Jalman Meadows, which was like in the middle of nowhere. And it was more like cowboy country. Like you could just gallop off, you know, to the far end, like, and if you fell or whatever, were alone, like no one would be able to find you for days, I think. But what was fun about Mongolia was just how wild it was like when we were about to ride the guys were breaking in some of the horses and we were sitting on really hard saddles like they were made out of wood and we'd be doing three hour trails every day so we stayed out camping in gurs that's what they call them and it was just so much fun because we'd cross rivers so it was so different from what we grew up doing and in other countries where I go trail riding, you learn just different ways of how they care for their horses and what the horses are used to. Because just because maybe you rode a horse in one country and you were able to gallop that horse doesn't really mean that you can ride any horse. It depends on who's training or taking care of the horses. So some horses are really met for tourists, so they're very quiet and they're used to following each other. whereas if you go to a stables, like for show jumping, there are other horses there that might not be friendly for beginners. And sometimes there's that misconception like, oh, I've already ridden before, you know, I can ride. But every horse has something new to teach you. And every horse has their own sort of personality, their own character. So you really have to trust the trainers, you know, that they know which horse to match you with. But yeah, I love doing trail rides abroad. I feel like that's really when I come alive and I get really excited. And I've felt before the, the rush that, you know, like I was saying that this is why I've ridden, like this is why I know how to, you know, ride different horses is for this purpose of feeling like when you go out to nature and the world, like it's just you and an animal and it's like a magnificent feeling. Danny speaks about embracing her past experiences as teachers and how being in the saddle taught her how to be grateful and present. 
One practice that I started in the past year that has helped me to do precisely that is doing kirtan meditation with Kaya of Little Shell Yoga. Kaya aims to create a space where participants can experience a state of relaxation and connection. Her training in Shargao for yoga and London for counseling and psychotherapy informs her yoga practice. Kaya offers kirtan, yin yoga, and yoga nidra. Kirtan is the practice of singing mantras in community, an opportunity to connect more deeply with ourselves and with others. Kaya holds space for a sharing circle at the end of these sessions. Yin yoga is a slower paced movement practice which focuses on strength and flexibility of our joints and connective tissues with poses held for two to five minutes. Props are used for support and ease. Yoga Nidra, often called yogic sleep meditation, is a guided full body mind relaxation practiced entirely lying down in the Shavasana pose. Although Yoga Nidra can be beneficial to anyone, Kaya especially loves sharing this practice with anyone who might be experiencing stress and anxiety. It is also a very accessible meditation for anyone with limited mobility or issues with traditional sitting meditations. You can sign up for her private sessions online via littleshellyoga.com or DM her on Instagram at little underscore shell underscore yoga. Tell her you found her through the pod. She would love to hear from you. Listen until the end of this episode, where she has shared with us a special mantra for listeners of the pod who may be feeling a tad stressed right now. Fun fact, she also loves animals and has worked extensively with Puppy Puddle Shargo. And now back to Danny on the healing power of nature and horses. I was watching also your video where you were speaking with Ballet Philippines about the history of horses. And I mean, I won't repeat the whole spiel here. I'll, well, I'll put a link to it in the show notes so our, our listeners can hear it. But you, you were talking about how, you know, horses have been on this planet for over 50 million years. They've been like man's partner since the dawn of civilization, like, you know, source of food and milk, beast of burden, helping with pulling carts and harvesting crops and, you know, fighting wars alongside people. And you, you also mentioned that over time, you know, they've become kind of a status symbol for sports and recreation, which is how some of these sports were born. Um, and by definition, kind of status symbols, I guess, are prized and coveted because fewer people have access to them. I was doing a bit of research on this before I got on the call with you. It seems like there seem to be more efforts being made for more inclusivity in the sport. Do you think you could talk a little bit about those efforts? Well, here in the country, it is exclusive because the Manila Polo Club is the biggest facility and it requires you to be a member, but they do allow like sponsored guests to come in and take lessons, but to own a horse and to maintain it there is also pretty expensive. So actually now that we're opening our farm in Silangkavite, we'd like it to be also another equestrian center that could help the sport expand. You know, we think it's more exciting to have more competitors and it pushes everyone to be better riders as well. In Europe or in the States, I think it's becoming more popular. In Europe, you know, they say that there's like a stables every 15 kilometers. So riding or equestrian is pretty normal. And there are many opportunities to go to the top. You don't specifically like have to be from a well-to-do background. Like you can start as a groom and then, you know, as you progress, people start to give you horses and then they start to get sponsored and all that. But in the States, uh, they're starting to hold more horse shows. There's more attention because there's certain um, celebrities who make it interesting. And when I say celebrities, like they are either the, the daughters of like billionaires, you know, like Steve Jobs' daughter or Bill Gates' daughter, like they make that look like the glamorous, you know, thing to do. And then they're starting to televise it more. And then big brands like Hermes, are also starting to sponsor horse shows and, and market to the people and stuff. So I think 
yeah, people are starting to know more about the sport and, and watch and, and become fans of it. Like in the Middle East as well, like now that, you know, their teams are pretty strong, they're hosting horse shows there. So more people are watching and then they're becoming more educated about, you know, the safe practices. So like our, our sport, although to do it at the high level is very expensive, at least, you know, people are starting to appreciate it and they've started to bring horse shows, like top level horse shows to Asia. Like in Hong Kong, they hosted what they call the Longines Masters, where they actually fly in competitors from Europe and around the world. And then we get to watch them close by, right? Like it's usually, you know, having to go to the expensive cities like Paris or you know, to watch the five-star events and you, you pay a lot for the tickets and stuff. So now uh, we can watch things online, like they have an FEI TV. So I think that makes it more inclusive as well. Yeah, I saw that it's kind of one of the fast, or the countries where it's growing the fastest would be China also, right? Like with the last Olympics, I think, what was his name? Alex Hua Tian, I think, who's like half British, half Chinese qualified for the Olympics, so suddenly it reinvigorated or it started this renewed interest in the sport, right? Maybe that's why they're also bringing it to some Asian cities, because there's a larger demand now. Would you agree with that? Yes, I think so. Around Southeast Asia, you have countries like Thailand, even Cambodia, actually, they have their own equestrian team, you'll be surprised. And that's thanks to Angelina Jolie, because <laughs> she apparently helped some of the riders. But yeah, they're, they're starting to, you know, hold horse shows of the higher level. Like they recently had the Asian Championships in Thailand, uh, which is uh, sort of to show the world that, yeah, we're able to, in Southeast Asia, host these uh, big competitions. Yeah. Is it big in South Asia? Because like Polo started, is that right? Polo started in kind of India? Yes, I think that's correct. In China, like what you mentioned a while ago, since they're open out to the world more, like they've had a lot of people who find it really glamorous, right? So they're in kind of in a hurry and they, they want to get that high jumper horse already. So that's the thing about the sport as well. It's like you can't do shortcuts in order to be a rider to be safe you really have to form that bond with the horse and to answer your question in south asia i'm not so sure what the show jumping scene is like there but like you said polo i think yes is quite popular i think even here in the philippines it might be more popular now than how many years ago we might have more or we definitely have more polo players than we do have equestrians. Is there a crossover? Like, do some people compete in both? Yes, there have been some show jumpers. Well, I only know a handful that have turned into polo players. And usually, though, there are not that many polo players who are interested to do show jumping. It's also a whole different ball game. It's like you ask a football player, if they're willing to do ballet, for example, you know, even though we have like, it's one facility where we kind of like both share with the polo players, the equestrians here in the Philippines, there are not that many who cross over. Sure. I'm just thinking because what they have in common is the horse, but the discipline of one doesn't necessarily cross over to the other. Yeah. No, yeah, like polo is a game in a way, like, you know, you, you have to shoot the ball, but uh, in equestrian, it's not a team sport. So the horses also are different in the way, you know, they train. So it's totally different in a way. Sure. It's a good thing that the sport is expanding. So if some people maybe wanted to consider this as a career, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who is just starting out, whatever age they are? Be prepared to work hard and be open to learning. Like, it doesn't stop. 
even if you know you're tired you sometimes just have to push yourself and be really disciplined i think the best riders have very good attention to detail and good feel like a natural instinct a good attitude most importantly so yeah i think you can enjoy but safety should be your priority you want to be able to last long in this sport and make the right decisions of course like go with the right people because that could really mean the world like it's totally the people that you choose to surround yourself that will make such a big impact for your sport yeah and then if you had to kind of scare off somebody who was on the fence or not 100% sure if this is what they wanted to do and you know you would tell them don't take this job if you blank what would you put in that blank don't take this job if you're not ready to be pushed around and even just like falling off the horse for the first time can come as such a shock like depends of course how you fall but some kids actually they say that you know falling off as a kid is better because they sort of are lighter so the impact isn't so traumatizing but they are so shocked it's as if someone pushed you to the ground really hard even if you're not that hurt sometimes just your ego is so bruised also by that so if you're scared to get physically injured to the point that it causes you so much mental anxiety then you might not be suitable for this sport cuz you really have to have a tough mind and you have to be ready eventually you will fall off if you are in this sport long enough i can't count how many times i've fallen and i'm only lucky that you know knock on wood i haven't broken any bones but i've had concussions and what's good is i don't remember them exactly but you know down the line i hope that you know like i still have my brains intact but like all jokes aside right you just have to yeah just be be tough <laughs> Sure. And then what I found really interesting when you were telling me about some of your students was there are some corporate professionals who go and get in some riding before their day starts like they'll go really early uh like I don't know 5 or 6 a.m. get in an hour of riding and then be in the office by like 8 or 9 cuz your your farm is quite close to Makati or central business district here in the Philippines, right? So I thought that was really interesting. Maybe If you wanted to sell the benefits of riding or learning how to ride to somebody who wasn't thinking of pursuing it as a career but just wanted to take it up as like a leisure activity, how do you think that riding helps them in other aspects of their lives? So riding is actually like a whole body workout. So you have cardiovascular benefits. It makes you supple your back and everything you know you have to have core strength you of course have to have coordination and quick reflexes in a way riding is like yoga you really have to stay present and with the breath and have body awareness i like to teach my classes actually like a yoga class like when i first did yoga i was surprised that wow like the teacher is really trying to make you feel all your muscles and in riding there are certain muscles that are being used that every day muscles you know you're not it's not the same like you're really made to sort of mold your body so that you can look like you're one with the horse you know so you know joining of course forces with another animal is such a great feeling like it gives you a high like no other especially if you start jumping it's so much fun the adrenaline rush you know and uh you have to also be mentally strong because horses they are pretty smart they know what kind of rider so each horse you know will either be calm and fun to ride or they can really be challenging so 
I think that aspect uh, is interesting, like for people not just to think riding is just sitting there and then the horse is doing all the work, but that's another misconception. It's like, you really have to be, you know, mind, body, spirit aligned. <laughs> Sounds like an exercise in being present, which I think we can all benefit from in this uh, pandemic, right? Exactly. You really have to also focus because your horse can pick up on your energy and emotions. And if you're not in the right state on that day, like if your mind is buzzing with so many things, then the horse will sense that. So like you said, we all need to be present. And with horses, they are the greatest teachers of being present. Sure. Can you tell us what's next in terms of your career plans and goals or even the plans you guys have for DXD? Well, like I mentioned, we would like to continue developing the farm so that it could one day be like an events place, perhaps host competitions, uh, have a bigger riding school so that we can also cater to the South because now there are more uh, villages and schools opening up. So uh, we would like to also maybe find partners, whether it would be with like dogs to have also dog shows or to have like a dog park or something. Then I would like to start my equine assisted therapy program. But right now I'm still in talks with another animal assisted therapy group so that maybe they can help me kind of formalize my program because I am certified, you know, from the U.S. I did courses for equine assisted therapy and I was a equine specialist. But if I really want to do it the right way, then I need to find a licensed professional like psychotherapist who I can work with so that when we do give the therapy, it's legit, you know, like we really need to be responsible with people's lives. And I am hoping that, you know, down the line, maybe I can take a psychology course or try to find a team who can really help me do it more often. Um, right now, my brother and I and my mom are the main instructors, but who knows, maybe our team will expand. We'd be able to train um, more people or some people would want to work with us and become horse trainers as well. So yeah, I'm just excited to see how we can create another community in the out of town, out of the city. That's so nice. If you could go back in time, what advice would you give to your younger self or what would you maybe do differently? Well, there was a time that my younger self didn't really, I guess, appreciate how good I had it in terms of, you know, my horses. I felt because my parents were both in the sport a little bit like uh, stuck. Like I thought that, you know, this is the only path that I had, but I would tell myself like, hey, you know, there are not that many people that get to do what you do. So be grateful, work hard, you know, like really just focus instead of be like partying. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's why I pushed myself. I knew I had to get out of Manila and I, I went to Singapore so that I get pushed outside of my comfort zone. And it really helped. It really made me value home and hard work. Singapore gave me such a good work ethic to be really responsible for everything, you know, not just for, you know, the horses and myself, but to think of other people to be really trying to cater because horses have such a powerful reach. So if I can harness their intuition and I can harness their healing power to help people, then I think what I went through actually, all the deciding what to do with my life, I think then it serves its purpose now that I can teach and help people. That's like coming full circle. It's beautiful. Exactly. Yeah. I have a little trivia round coming up, but before we do that, I was just curious because I was reading somewhere that when the horses travel, they also need a passport. 
And then it got me thinking of how difficult it's been to travel or how difficult it will be to travel with this pandemic for humans, right? Let alone the horses. So can you talk about maybe some of the challenges that you're seeing because of this pandemic and kind of how people are working around those just barriers to the continuity of the sport under current situations? Because there's an international like events component, right? Well, yes, when you're a certain level, then that's where competitions abroad are more ideal because here in the Philippines, like very limited, there are not that many competitors. Like it's better to sort of spend your money, you know, leaving a horse in a way abroad so that you can compete against more people. And now, of course, there are a few people who get to do that. But yeah, I think. For us, it's the buying and selling of horses. Like usually, because we buy our horses all abroad. So, you know, right now there are only a few for sale in the market. So people have to either choose from what there is available or they have to wait until the travel restrictions, you know, will allow them again to go out of the country and stuff. But like we were supposed to watch the Olympics last year. So that was a pity because, you know, Japan is so close. And I don't know if we'll still be able to watch it this year. But for us, it's only in terms of the training. The training is what is not possible for us to go abroad to our foreign coaches and then to, you know, stay there a couple of weeks. Some of our students, they wanted to do that. But yeah, not possible. Yeah, so I guess there'll be a bigger demand for DXD, at least for those that are starting out and want to not get rusty, for those who are kind of more intermediate or advanced already. Yeah, so I look forward to seeing the expansion of uh, your project over there. Yeah, thank you. So I have a little trivia round, just like a break from some of the occupational hazards that we just discussed, because you gave us a very, very, I think, vivid image of what a day in the life looks like for somebody uh, in, in your shoes, no? So just a few quick questions. What inspires you? Uh, certain people, I think, inspire me to work hard, like watching people, whether it be in competition or here, like seeing my students progress. Uh, I think that inspires me to keep coaching, that you know, they're learning a lot of values from the sport. Travel inspires me. I love going to different places and meeting different people and finding different ways to do what you do back home. And then, of course, like, you know, seeing stuff sometimes online, like seeing, you know, beautiful things, of course, art. I love, you know, those are the things that inspire me. Speaking of art, what's your favorite work of art or you know it can be in the visual arts like a painting or in more of media and entertainment is there a work of art featuring a horse that you like i feel like there's so many stories written about horses yeah that's a good question i have a favorite artist who does horse paintings called george stubbs um but i can't think yet at the top of my head which work of art but I know his famous painting is called Whistle Jacket. And that actually looks like the horse that my brother used to own. I think it's, it's, it's very nice, the painting. But yeah, I, I can't think of one certain work. I don't know the title of George Stubbs' other work. So yeah, I think it's all his pieces that have to do with horses. I love seeing them. Yeah. What about recommended reading? It does not have to be horse related, but for people who have some time on our hands, is there anything you're reading now that you think we would be interested in? Well, I'm reading this book called Untamed by Glennon Doyle. And it's been interesting because it's about women, you know, breaking out of the mold. So that's something that, you know, I, I want to finish as soon as I can, because uh, it's a good point of view. Yep. What about any podcasts that you're listening to? Well, I usually listen to Tim Ferriss. Like I started 
listening to him early on like I was reading his four hour work week <laughs> which is I was trying to apply to my life but I like listening to some of his speakers because they all are you know also well known in their field successful so I like getting like tips from them then there are the other podcasts like TED Talks or the Motivational Mindset you know I like the self-help stuff <laughs> What about a fictional character that you most identify with? Fictional character. I don't know. Like, I think reading Harry Potter when I was younger, I know it sounds super nerdy, but like, it's because I, I started reading more because of Harry Potter. So growing up with the books just really felt like, I don't know, I was part of that world. <laughs> like, <laughs> it sounds so dorky, but. It was, you know, those characters that come to mind, like when, when you asked me this question. Sure. What about what's your proudest achievement? Um, I think that when I was competing and I was trying to go for the Southeast Asian Games, there were some competitions and some qualifiers that I won. One of them was, you know, after a week of having hardship in my horse. And, and that was the first qualifier for the Southeast Asian Games. And I cleared the round um, at the one meter 25, one meter 30 level. Um, then I went with my horse Paris in Malaysia. I also won this Queen's Cup. And then, I don't know, I, I think also like the accumulation of these competitions uh, helped me gain points to get the Riding school rider of the year when I was younger. Uh, those, I think, were my proudest achievements. Nice. And then to wrap this up, note because it's been like you mentioned, you're you want to work more with people doing kind of licensed therapists, like psychologists. There's been a lot of anxiety now during the pandemic. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to somebody? who was kind of in an uncertain phase in their life, whether a career or personal, because, I mean, you work in a field where you're actively trying to kind of calm people down and make them process all of the things they're going through. So any advice that you would give those people who are anxious at this moment? Well, you're welcome to come to my ranch and experience the horses. I think even just being outdoors in nature and in a space with a horse can be very relaxing because I can imagine, yeah, if you're stuck in your room all day, that it could be, you know, like I know what it feels like now to be those horses that are stuck in the city in a stall during this pandemic. Like it really showed me, you know, the importance of going out. It's fresh air. I think for those who are going through anxiety, to be really present and horses, like I said, are the best teachers or mirrors. They can really sense when you're misaligned, whether you have incongruent behavior is what they call it. Like when your mind, you know, is saying one thing, but your body is saying one thing and, and horses are very good at picking up on your body language. So you know, come visit my farm and we have other animals and it's just, just soothing, you know, to just pet, to have like another big creature just be there for you. And, and you can talk to the horse and they have their own characters. They have their own personalities that are very charming, you know, and um, yeah. How can people find you online, Danny, so that they can DM you if they want to set an appointment at the farm? You can go to our website, dxdequestrian.wixsite slash dxdequestrian, or you can find us on Instagram or Facebook at, at dxdequestrian. Okay, I'm super excited. I hope you get more visitors because I think what you're doing there is something we really need in this urban jungle that so many of us uh, live in right now. So for those who are able to make it down there, I hope that they can experience the therapeutic effect of nature and the horses and learning from such world-class instructors such as yourself. Oh, thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for uh, sharing your experiences with us.
Yeah, I hope, you know, I could help and inspire. But yeah, I'm so flattered that you invited me to talk in your podcast. I almost feel like, you know, from your other speakers, like, what? Why me? But, you know, I'm glad I to share my passion. I really hope that people really appreciate the animals and they come and see what it's like for themselves. Okay, thanks, Donnie. Right. Okay, thank you, Joe. Okay, bye. Hi there, my name is Kaya. Welcome to Little Shell Yoga. Today I'll be sharing with you and guiding you through a very simple, very easy morning mantra practice. What I'm sharing with you today has grown out of my own personal practice. It's something that I've luckily received from my teachers. So I'm really, really excited to share it with you today. So the instrument that I have right here is called a small harmonium, it's called a dolce tina, and it's going to accompany us on our mantra today. So in terms of how you can use this mantra, you can either listen to this mantra or you can sing along with me if you feel like it, if you feel like you're, you're called to do that today. And one of the great things about mantra is that it, uh, it gives our mind something to rest on. It gives our mind something to focus on. So if you're someone that has a bit of a difficult time, let's say with a traditional seated meditation, perhaps you could try this mantra and focus your mind completely on this mantra. So it's said that you can use mantras as a raft. So if our mind is like this consciously, continuously, I mean, churning sea with massive waves, mantra can be the raft in that sea. So if you feel your thoughts starting to wander, just return to the mantra. Feel yourself getting taken away, just come back to the mantra. That is really all there is. So this particular mantra that we will be singing together today or you'll be listening to today is a mantra that is one of my favorite mantras. And it goes, Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu. And that translates as May all beings be free, may all beings be happy, and may any one of my thoughts, actions, or words today contribute to the happiness and well being of all. So it's a beautiful mantra to set the intention of a day and to really direct your intentions for the day. So, Loka. Samasta Sukino Babantu.
So thank you so much for taking part and making time for yourself to do our mantra together. Again, Loka Samasta Sukhino Pavantu. May all beings be happy, may all beings be free, and may any one of my thoughts, actions, or words that I put forward today contribute to the happiness and well-being of all. And don't forget to include yourself in that wish, that intention of compassion and freedom. Thank you so much, and hopefully see you on that soon. Thanks for listening, guys. Don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, and share with a friend so that others can find the pod as well. Do check out at occupationalhazards.podcast on Instagram, where we have more updates from our guests and some listener feedback. Slide into our DMs. We'd love to hear from you. Catch you next episode.